Welcome back to TarHillIllustrated.com. And if you're watching on our YouTube channel, Tar Hill Illustrated, I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner. And joining me as he always does for the THI Football Preview Podcast, our very young publisher, Andrew Jones. And Andrew, we're here for the last THI Football Preview Podcast of the season as Carolina prepares to take on number five, Texas A&M, in the Orange Bowl. That's on January 2nd, this Saturday, 8 p.m. kickoff down in Miami. AJ, um, let, let's kind of dive right into it as we always do. I think we need to address the, the opt-outs as we've done in the previous podcast. We need to add another one to that list, which we haven't talked about on a podcast so far. Deami Brown, Michael Carter, and Chas Surratt all opted out earlier. And then we learned a few days ago that Javante Williams has also opted out. So you got your best wide receiver, your, your two best running backs on the team, both opting out. And then you add that best linebacker as well. AJ, how big do you think those opt-outs are going to be for this team as they prepare for a really good Texas A&M team? Well, anytime you lose four of your best players and yeah. extremely productive guys, Carter's the fourth all-time leading rusher in Carolina mm-hmm. history. He's the, only the second back-to-back thousand-yard guy since Nature and Means in the early 90s. Diami's the only two-time thousand-yard receiver in Carolina mm-hmm. history. And Chaz led the team of tackles the last two years, two-time first-team All-ACC guy, going to go very high in the NFL draft incredible athlete he's gonna wow the you know what out of people at the nfl combine Mm -hmm. yeah i mean you can't pull four guys like that out of the equation and say it's the same team but it is the same approach it's not like they're gonna put in a whole new offense for josh henderson here last week and this week Mm -hmm. it's amazing some of the stuff i've been reading that people have been saying about how well a and m doesn't have tape of these guys the scheme is the scheme yeah, the plan exactly. is the plan. And you still have Sam Howe. And you still have a lot of wide receivers that, as as Choffrey Brown tweeted mm-hmm. the other day, hey, they recruited us for a reason. Look, great pro. if you want to be what they said they want to be, which is Ohio State and Clemson and Alabama, mm-hmm. you have to learn how to handle losses like this when guys mm-hmm. go. They're getting an, an amazing opportunity in just the 25th month of this uh, regime to find out how they handle that, to find out what some of the other guys look like. And they're going to get a chance to see Elijah Green and, and Josh Henderson. They're going to get a chance to see Eugene Asante. Jay Bateman was telling us back in August, uh, Eugene Asante could play. we got to get him on the field. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. we're going to find out Saturday in Miami Gardens how, how where he is right now as a player. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's big when you lose those guys, but they have other dudes. And now we get to see what those dudes can do. And it's an amazing snapshot into the future for the staff. And what a great opportunity for the staff to see these guys in action and then have the entire offseason to say, okay, there's a couple of things you definitely need to get better at. And they yeah. had that time. It's better to get that intel now for the 21 season than to find out in September. Mm-hmm. 100%. Yeah, it definitely is. I, I, I think the law, like, we kind of talk, we've talked about it on previous podcasts and, and we've obviously talked about it off camera. Obviously the losses are big. You never want to lose literally your, I think if you throw Sam Howell into that, if you had Sam Howell, that would be kind of the top five players on the team. And I don't think anybody would argue I mean, with that. Sam would be a bigger loss than any of those guys. Absolutely. I think Chaz is the biggest loss of this group. Mm-hmm. I know you didn't ask, but I'm going to say it anyway. I think Chaz is the biggest loss because I agree. Carolina has more dudes that they could absorb with on offense. And mm-hmm. the scheme is what it is. And you have your quarterback. I mean, if, look, let's, if, if Choffrey, Choffrey Brown could catch the ball. So if Sam puts it where it needs to go and he gets over, we've seen him with some big plays already. His numbers are comparable to what Diami's was his first spring year. Mm-hmm. And that's the other thing, by the way, you know, Chaz was a quarterback for two years. When he switched over to linebacker, people ridiculed us for reporting that that move was going to happen. And that move was in the works before Mac was hired. Mm-hmm. All, all those wheels were already in motion. He had some decisions to make. And, and he made the switch and people thought, my goodness, well, okay, he's either not going to be able to do it, or if he does, that's how bad this program is if a quarterback ends up being a good linebacker. Well, that theory was thoroughly debunked. The Army <laughs> had 17 receptions his freshman year and exploded for consecutive thousand yard seasons. Nobody really saw that coming. And Javante Williams had 10 carries against Power Five to get FBS teams leading up to the NC State game at the conclusion of the 18 season, Larry's last game. Mm-hmm. Javante had 10 carries against FBS teams going into that game. He had a pretty good game that afternoon. Nobody anticipated over 2,000 yards the next two years. Remember, nobody yeah, right. anticipated that. And that's what they got. 
So Josh Henderson, Elijah Green, and Joffrey Brown, and Josh Downs, and Eugene Asante, maybe they're just the next wave. And if they are, we'll see the first leg of it uh, Saturday. AJ, let's dive a little bit deeper in kind of the matchup a little bit. Uh, Carolina obviously coming off a, a pretty good regular season. I mean, obviously some losses in there that that hurt, but we've kind of talked about it in a previous podcast. I don't think the team was ready to win those games against FSU and Virginia when they did lose them. And, and as we've seen, they've gotten a lot better. We've talked about the process. And I think that always kind of all capped off with a, with a huge win over Miami, uh, down in Miami in the regular season finale. You look at Texas A&M, number five team in the country, like I mentioned, eight and one overall finished eight and one in the SEC. So all SEC games um, only lost coming to a really good Alabama team. They've got a good win over Florida as well. Also beat Auburn a few weeks ago. So this is a good Texas A&M team. They're the second best rushing attack in the SEC. Isaiah Spiller, their running back has been huge for this team. Um, you look at Carolina kind of in terms of that matchup, Carolina's really struggled to defend their own a lot this season. I think they're averaging like 140, letting up like 147 yards per game on, on, on the ground as a defense. So look at that matchup. It's not great. And then you kind of flip over to the other side. Texas and has got a really good defensive line. Carolina at times has struggled um, offensively to, to, to protect Sam Howe. We saw that against Notre Dame and, and also saw it in some other games this year, especially kind of the likes of Virginia and FSU, the games that Carolina's really struggled in. Sam Howell hasn't a lot of time to to be back there to kind of do what he wants to do. So I think looking at this matchup on paper, especially when you add in the opt-outs, this, this is a really tough game for Carolina. But nonetheless, like you mentioned, they've got the guys, they've got the personnel, they've got the talent to go out there and really compete against Texas A&M. And you never know how, how things can play out. It's a bowl game. You never know who's going to show up. You see it so many times in these bowl games these teams get a little bit of a break and you kind of never know what team you're going to get on game day. But I think on paper, this is a really intriguing matchup because a lot of Texas A&M strengths are some of Carolina weaknesses and kind of vice versa in that as well. Well, A&M uh, averages almost three sacks a game in <clears throat> Carolina's three losses. Sam was sacked 15 times in the eight wins. He was sacked 15 times mm -hmm. and he was actually charged with like six of those by PFF. Um, and some of that was earlier in the year when he was kind of holding on the ball a little longer than he has in the second half of the year. So uh, that, that is an issue. I think Texas A&M really good against the run number three run defense in the country. Alabama only 3.9 yards of carry in that game. Of course, Bama was hitting on big pass plays. And I think Carolina could have something there. A&M's not great in pass defense. Really good at rushing the quarterback. Really good at getting some hurries but they do give up some big plays, and that's certainly one of Carolina's strengths. Uh, but the run game, the, the offensive line is going to have a, a real task here. We think this is a good offensive line. I think the staff thinks this is a good offensive line. There's some potential NFL guys there. Zudu certainly, McKeithen probably, Tucker possibly. Mm -hmm. But they're going to have a challenge because A&M's front is really good. They're really good against the run, and they put a lot of pressure on the passer. Yeah. Uh, Bobby Brown, one of their linemen – has a sack in each of the last six games. <laughs> so this game's going to be one at the line of scrimmage. Absolutely. So we can talk about receivers and running backs opted out and all that kind of stuff. The line of scrimmage and whatever kind of fortification Carolina's linebackers can provide, which is why I think this and Chaz will be a pretty big deal. So mm -hmm. if Carolina can protect Sam, they can generate some kind of a run game. Tar Heels will be able to run their offense. They'll be able to run it in tempo and they will move the ball. On the other side, Big task for Carolina's defensive line. And there's no mistake about it. It, it. The line's been better since they started playing the younger guys and, and, and having a deeper rotation. There's no doubt that the line's been better, but it's still not great. And AM has a bunch of dudes in the offensive line that will be in NFL camps. I mean, some people say it's the best offensive line in, in, in the right SEC. Now. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say Bama doesn't it's have the up best there, everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's so, that's up really, there. so that's really the task there at the line of scrimmage. I just think that <clears throat> Carolina's defensive line hasn't yet shown me that it could step up and win a game. They've been okay in stretches. They've been okay in stretches. And they were pretty good for a while in Miami. And that's the last thing we saw. So maybe that's becoming who they are. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that the defensive line is ready for 70 snaps against this. Yeah. Maybe they are. Who knows? But uh, and also AM doesn't turn the ball over a lot. Kellamon, 19 touchdown passes, three interceptions. So even if the secondary plays well, 
Carolina hasn't been a team that flips the field very much. They don't get a lot of takeaways. AM mm-hmm. doesn't give the ball away a lot. So Carolina's going to have to be solid on defense and get off the field every once in a while. And the offense is going to have to be excellent for them to win yeah. this game. Yeah, that's that's I agree with everything you said there. That's the biggest thing I'm kind of looking forward to watching and seeing how that plays out as Carolina's young defensive line that, like you mentioned, has gotten better when these young guys have come in going up against an offensive line that I think is, is one of the nation's best and is a finalist for the Joe Moore award. So you're going up against one of the most talented O lines. I'm sure it's a very experienced one as well. And you've got a bunch of young guys on Carolina's defensive line. Like you mentioned, that, but, but, you, go ahead, go ahead. Wait, I gotta throw this in there. They call their offensive line the Maroon Goons. Oh man, <laughs> you gotta love that. Five point four like yards that. of carry, only four sacks allowed. It's a task. And the beautiful thing about this, if you care about Carolina, we cover Carolina. A lot of you watching this care about Carolina. You have a passion there. Mm-hmm. You're gonna find out a lot about where the program is right now. And so the yeah. intel, the information the staff is gonna get, regardless of the outcome of this game will benefit Carolina moving forward. So it doesn't matter what the outcome is in the sense that the staff's going to go into the offseason knowing a lot more about the program for this matchup than if they were to go into a lesser bowl and play, you know, some oh, of the yeah. trash that's playing in some of these lower bowls. Yeah, you're not bowls. lying, man. Some of these teams bowls are losing so records. <laughs> yeah. It's There's it's some it's teams it's that unfortunately are playing clubs that losing records. They may not, they may not be as good a gauge as you want to get from a bowl game. Exactly. But Carolina staff, they're going to have an opportunity to see what these guys are all about because I bet you a and is going to be ready to play. Yeah, like, I mean, if you're not playing in the college football playoff, I mean, this is the next best thing. You're playing the number five team in the country that's, you know, just finished outside of it and finished, you know, the, with that loss to Alabama is pretty much the only reason that they're not in it right now. So, yeah, it's an it's an intriguing matchup and it's, it's an exciting matchup for me because, like you said, you got a lot of young guys that haven't really played as much snap due to the opt-outs they're going to have to play and then – not even because of the opt-outs. you got a lot of young guys, especially on that defense and on that defensive line that haven't really played a, a competition like this, maybe barring Notre Dame. So really good test for this team. And regardless of what the outcome is, I think this program, this staff, and this team is going to learn a lot, and it's going to help them uh, moving into next season. AJ, yeah, before we wrap this up. And how did Notre Dame go? After yeah. the first two offensive possessions, Carolina didn't do squat. Nothing. So, But yeah. one of the things that we've seen that this program – can do is it learns how to it's learned how to learn oh for sure you mentioned earlier we've discussed this before when people say man they should have won at fsu they should have won in charlotte well no they shouldn't have no they lost those games because that's who they were at that time mm-hmm. and the only way to get to the to where they were in miami two weeks ago when they routed miami was to learn from that stuff you just don't snap a finger and ascend to the top 10 it is a climbing process and mac mm-hmm. recognizes this. mac calls it phases we call it process. It's the same mm-hmm. thing. And and that was part of their process to, to, to play those games, <clears throat> to have the Wake Forest game where they give up 53 points, forcing a change, forcing the staff to say, we've got to throw these younger guys in there. We've got to give them a chance. And Tony Grimes and Jaquirius commonly go in there, play 29, the last 29 snaps, and the defense changed that game mm-hmm. against Wake Forest. They gave up 53 points and 500 something yards that day, <laughs> but the defense changed and it's been consistently better since then. It is a process. You must learn. In order to learn, you have to have games, you need intel, and they've had a lot of it. So, whatever happens Saturday, they're going to learn from it. And I think that that's, to me, the coolest thing about this game. And it's an opportunity to get a win, Jacob. If yeah. Carolina beats them with those guys out, that's going to that's gonna change where the Tar Heels start in the rankings next season. That's oh, yeah. going to change the offseason chatter about Carolina where people are going to say, look, keep an eye on this team for the CFP. No one mentioned Texas A&M back in August when they were talking mm-hmm. about the CFP. Mm-hmm. But that program took the next step under Jimbo Fisher. Carolina could take the next step next year uh, given its schedule and the, op- and the, and the kind of team it's going to have back if it wants to contend for a CFP, you've got to be in the chatter. I think that team for the Big Ten got in because of those Buckeye stickers on the helmet. Yeah, and you've got to, be able to develop, right. you've got to be able to develop a little name brand on the football field. Carolina's mm-hmm. got a long way to go there, but yeah. a win here could give them a whole offseason of positive chatter, which will just move that needle in the, in the right direction. Exactly. Yeah, it's 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 an opportunity, and that's all you can really ask for. It's a huge opportunity for this team, and regardless of who's not playing and who is playing, this is an opportunity for Carolina to go play in an Orange Bowl and beat a really good team against Texas A&M, and not only maybe beat them, 
but kind of see where they stack up against a program and, and against a team that's in a position that they're trying to get to ultimately in Mac Brown's second uh, season going into his third. So AJ, last thing I want to talk about before we wrap this thing up, man, I always kind of end the, the podcast with this question. What do you think Carolina has to do to win this football game? Protect Sam, run the ball well enough. They don't need 270 yards rushing or anything like that, but they got to be in the 150, 160 range. Got to give some, yeah. Yeah, you got to be able to – those RPOs have to work to your advantage. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they, they have to keep the defense on his toes a little bit. And Sam has to be really good. In order to be really good, he, he can't be running for his life. No. He's got to be able to go through his progressions. If the receivers are finding grass, he's got to see them when they find grass. Mm-hmm. So that's number one. Number two, they have to be decent on defense. Uh, I don't think they have to be great. Because if the offense does what I just said, the defense – I mean, when was the defense great at all this year? I guess That's a great team. point. That's a great they, point. They were, they were actually really good in a stretch against Miami. Yeah, they were. Mm-hmm. And I think that this is a comparable offense that they're going up against. Not a dynamic offense, a good offense. Maybe runs the ball a little bit better than Miami. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the Tar Heels need to just get off the field. Don't worry about the stats. They need to get off on third down, uh, fourth down, and force some punts. Maybe get a couple of turnovers. And then they cannot lose the game on special teams. And special teams we haven't talked about for a while, and that's actually good. You know, if you're, in a, if you're in a referee or an umpire, the best thing in the world is when nobody talks about you at the end of the game. Yeah. They didn't really notice you. It means you did a pretty good job, right? Yeah, exactly. Special teams is kind of the same way. I don't think special teams has to win games for you, but they can't lose games for you. Yeah. And, and, and Texas A&M has a really strong special teams. Carolina statistically doesn't look that good, but it's been better the second half of the season. So they cannot give up any catastrophics on special teams. So those are basically, I mean, it's a pretty simple formula for every game, but certainly for this game, you, they're probably going to need someone to step up and make a big play. They almost need that quote unquote gift touchdown. Or mm-hmm. if they do get one on special teams, or, or let's say someone picks off a pass and runs it in, they're probably going to need a moment like that in order to win mm-hmm. this game. A&M's better team. A&M's favored for a reason. A&M should win this game. But they don't play the games on paper. They got to go out and line up. And bowl games can be really weird, man. They can be really quirky. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We assume a and is going to have their ears pinned back and be ready to play. But maybe talking about it for two weeks and complaining about the, power, the the CFP and some of the other stuff, maybe that kind of wears out. Mac has told us before, you don't ever want to play the game mentally on Tuesday and Wednesday. Because no. then you got nothing left by Saturday. Mm-hmm. So how has Jimbo been able to handle the emotion and the energy of A&M as they get – to Miami Gardens. We'll see. If they've expended a lot of it, Carolina's got a better chance. I think Carolinas will be fine. The guys opting out probably will give this team a little bit more juice. Yeah. They're competitive guys. They got something to prove. And they got some talented kids that are going to get an opportunity to play a lot. So we'll see. Exactly, AJ. Exactly. A yeah, very intriguing matchup. And AJ, you'll be down there in Miami for that one. So as always, guys, be sure to check back on Saturday for all the coverage you need from Miami. We'll definitely have you covered at TarHillIllustrated.com and on our YouTube channel, Tar Hill Illustrated. That's going to do it for the final episode of the THI Football Preview Podcast. Big thanks to everybody who's tuned in throughout the season. And as always, guys, be sure to like this video, be sure to share, and be sure to subscribe to our channel. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks. thanks.